some of Santa Clarita's finest are helping uh, Esther. She's fine. Uh, ladies, I just want you to know it was a very nasty man who invented high heels. I, I didn't even hear one amen. Wow, you must like wearing high heels. Okay, I, I believe she tripped over and um, may have may have sustained a bump on her head. So that is the uh, emergency services that you see being deployed on her behalf, and I think she'll be just fine for. For now, at least, that's what I'm told. So thanks to Eric for going and finding that out for us. But isn't it wonderful to know that if something were to happen here, if you were to be struck down in any way, you would, uh, you would have the services that are provided by a very wonderful town in which we live, uh, otherwise known as Awesome Town, right? <laughs> Is, is this is this true? Those of you those of you laughing, you're you're the ones who gave it that name, right? Awesome town. You did not give it that name, really? Okay. Well, I I learn a lot of things as I go around, and I I, I went around this week with a new friend of mine. Um, how many of you remember Isaac Martin? Isaac's still kicking, just barely. Isaac had a stroke five years ago. I went to visit him last Sabbath afternoon and got to know him and his daughter, Marguerite. Marguerite has had a long history working with the uh, street people in this town. And you might think, oh, we don't have any of those. Uh, we do. They just hide really well. So we're going to get to know what ministries are going on in our town in the near future, and there will be calls made for the opportunities that do exist in this town to be involved with those who maybe don't have what you have and then you know do so potentially on behalf of Jesus first of all and secondly on behalf of the Adventist Church which has a long history of wanting to be involved by the way our friends at the conference have told me that you can get involved, if you would like, in the Texas situation through Adventist Community Services and or ADRA, Adventist Development and Relief Agency, through donation at this point. But I will tell you, there are those of us who have been talking about even going down to Texas to see and to help. Uh, my wife and I did this during the time of Katrina, and I will tell you that it left an indelible impression upon me about the greatness of this country and the people that live in it and what they're willing to do to pull together when disaster strikes. If you've been watching like we've been watching this week, we are, I, I am, again, proud to be an American. There are people who have lost their lives in the last few days trying to help other people. Uh, some because of mistakes that they made inadvertently when they were trying to help their, their fellow man. Uh, terrible things have happened. But so many others have been averted because people were willing to get, you know, to go out of their way and, and to help their neighbor. And it's, it's happening already where people's houses are being cleared their walls are being gutted because that's what's going to have to happen to literally thousands and thousands of homes. They're going to need to be gutted right down to the, to the, to the wood, dried out, and then rebuilt because of the water. I've seen it happen. I've seen what happens in, in, uh, after Katrina, and so it's going, to happen, it's going to happen just in a much larger area now because of what's happened in, in Texas. Beaumont is still underwater, as you well know, and uh, we're praying that the that the water will go down uh, as quickly as quickly as possible, so that people can get back to their homes, and uh, actually, so that rescuers can get to some of the people who are still stranded. So, uh, I, I really want to thank God today uh, with you. Uh, this is a corporate opportunity for us to thank God for how He has led out and guided in this time of uh, great disaster 
biggest single downpour of water in American history. Uh, over 50 inches, 51, 52 inches of rain uh, nonstop. We've never seen anything like this before, and uh, people are talking about it. They're talking about it in biblical proportions. So what it offers us as those who are on looking is the opportunity to not only be Jesus in this moment, but also let people know that there is a God who cares for them and that there is a God who wants them home someday very soon when he comes back and that this opportunity gives, gives us the opportunity to, to share that, not only in Texas, but right here in Santa Clarita. Because you see, as the sermon title indicates, we have a Father in heaven. That fa he, 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 is, he is the one who we call Father, and in fact Jesus instructed us when he was instructing his disciples, that is how we are to address him. Now, uh, I want you to know that, that in this day and age, uh, the, the role of Father has become very difficult. Uh, it's not easy to be, quote-unquote, a good father, and there are those who have taken it upon themselves to, to be fathers, shall I say, of a different kind. And, and, and that has made it more difficult for those of us who would like to be godly fathers. And when I talk about this, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm referring to is the fact that, that they may be fathers that, that want everything for themselves. I'm just going to say it. They're selfish. Those, those fathers have made it very difficult for those of us who would like to, to, to put forward the idea that God shows us in Scripture that, that we should be like Him, like a father who is unselfish. So I'm, th I, I'm standing here today thanking our Father in Heaven that He sent His Son, Jesus, who said, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, finish it, you've seen the Father. <clears throat> I'm thanking Jesus today that he has given us a picture of our Father in Heaven. So that if we would like to claim, shall we say, a paternity, we hear in legal terms these days the idea of a paternity test. Who is the Father? Maybe you have asked yourself, who is my Father? Uh, I, I, you know, is there, is there such a thing as a biblical paternity test? I, I don't know. But I want to claim today the father of the Bible. And I want to claim him on your behalf as well, that, that we are connected to him and that he is connected to us, I believe is evidenced in the fact that he sent his son, our brother, in that sense, he sent his son to come and tell us, the father wants you home. Your father and my father. So paternity is an important concept that I want you to maybe think about a little bit this week. The second thing that I want you to think about this week is name. Our father who is in heaven. The God that we serve, my friends, is not just any God. He is the God of creation. He is the God who brought the Israelites out of Egypt. He has some very specific characteristics which no other God can claim. Our Father has a name and He has a family which He would like us all to be part of. Now recently you know that my daughter got married. And... Uh, uh, a few days later, after she got home from her honeymoon, about a week ago, we saw that the name on her Facebook changed. So now it's official. It felt kind of strange to introduce her as Mrs. Michaela Johnson. Okay, In, in that moment, I want you to know, because it was me, I, I, was, I was almost in a, in a, in a sort of dreamlike state. It was, it was not real in, in some ways. I was going through the motions. I was giving my daughter to what would now, has now become my son, which is all very crazy. I, you know, but then to see her name in print on Facebook, 
Thank God she said Michaela Stevenson Johnson. I just, I just, I, I felt that was very kind of her to, to leave, because you can call yourself whatever you want on Facebook, right? So it was, I, I felt very kind of her to leave her first name in life next to now the name that she has decided to take. And I'm, I'm wanting you to know I'm very proud now for us to be part of the Johnson family and that our names are now linked together because she has married Jay. And I, I'm looking forward to the time when, when they will come to visit us and we'll be able to introduce uh, Michaela. Some of you have met her already, but introduce Mrs. Michaela Johnson. It's a, it's, it's, a feeling, it's a feeling of accomplishment in some respects. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You have, you have married children. Some of you have little rugrats still, and you're thinking, it's going to be 25 years before this happens. But let me tell you, it's well worth the wait. And I want you to enjoy every stage. But when you come to that moment where your child, your girl child, or your boy child decides to take the name of someone else, and to join themselves with that family in, in a biblical sense, it is, it is incredible. It is wonderful. Friends, we have a God who has offered His name to us. When Jesus came and died on the cross, He has basically made it so that each and every one of us can choose to take His name as our own. The heritage that we have from Eve and Adam is one of rebellion. And a different name was taken at that time. A choice was made and a different kingdom was set up. And people have been taking that name all their lives. <clears throat> I say it's time to take the name of this world in vain. How'd you like that? Instead of saying, you know, oh God this or oh God that, why aren't we saying oh devil this or oh devil that? Why not say that the name we really want to revere is the name of God, is the name of our family, of our Father in heaven, rather than saying by our actions and the way that we're living, we really are connected to the family on this earth. The invitation comes every every time I read scripture that God would like us to be part of his family and to claim our heritage and to claim a new name. It's in Revelation chapter 3 that we learn that we are going to each and every one of us who have claimed this family name, we are also going to be given our own personal name when Jesus comes back. Remember he says, I believe it's halfway through chapter 3, that I will write your name on a white stone. If you don't believe me, just read it this afternoon. Write your name on a white stone. Each of us is going to have a personal name that God is going to give us. But in the meantime, he has a family that he would like us to be part of. He is the father of that family, and he has sent our elder brother, Jesus, to come down and show us how to be part of that family. Finally, in this phrase which we are dealing with today, which is the beginning of what men call the Lord's Prayer. I don't call it the Lord's Prayer. I call it the Disciples' Prayer because Jesus was teaching his disciples how to pray. If you want the Lord's Prayer, please go to John 17. This is Jesus praying to his Father on behalf of his disciples. That's, to me, the true Lord's Prayer. That's Jesus our Lord praying on our behalf. But when the disciples say, teach us to pray, this is what Jesus says. He says, pray our Father which art in heaven. The heaven part is the last piece that I want us to think about today. I, I think of this in, in terms of kingdom. I think of this in terms of domain. If you want to know about the God that we serve, if you want to know that he is our Father, that's great. If you want to know that he has a name that he wants us all to take so that we can be part of the same family, that's wonderful. But we need to know, where does this king reign? And so in his teaching for his disciples, Jesus says, know that this king 
is king of the entire universe. Heaven. I mean, define heaven. We've sent probes out. We know a lot more now than Galileo did. We know that some of the things he decided uh, uh, for which he was excommunicated from the church. The world is round. Okay. Copernicus and others finding out that what we had believed, what the church had been teaching was not true. That science can be a, a, a something that we can, we can grapple with in the church and that we should. We find out so much more. My favorite, I don't know if you look into the heavens like I do sometimes, I like to see it both on the internet, I like to see it live like the uh, eclipse that we, uh, that we all experience, uh, some of us more close than others. And, and then I, I also like the pictures that come back from spacecraft like the Hubble. My favorite is the Eagle Nebula. And it just continues to boggle my mind that it is, I, I believe, 26 light years across. Anyone want to tell me right now and tell the rest of us how much, how, how, how far is a light year? Um, 186,000 miles. 186. 186. Okay. Why is it 186,000 miles per second per second? Anyone know why? Come on, you physicists. Speed of light. The speed that light travels is 186,000 miles per second per second. The Eagle Nebula takes you 26 years of traveling at the speed of light to get across. Just let your, your mind cogitate that for a moment. And for all those of you who uh, want to know this re really cool fact, I'll, I'll tell it to you now. If you get in a spacecraft that could do the speed of light, as far as speed, and you travel out from the Earth 12 hours, 12 Earth hours, and then you turn straight around and you travel straight back 12 hours, Earth time, or, or Earth hours, how many years would have passed on Earth? Now, you've got to be Einstein. Remember, I'm just going to tell you, Einstein's involved in this calculation. Theory of relativity comes into mind here. Anyone? How much time, if you go out 12 hours and you come back 12 hours, how much, how many, well, oh, that'll give it away, won't it? <laughs> how much time will have passed on Earth? One thousand years. The Bible is not lying when it says a year for a day. It's not lying when it says that a day is like a thousand years. A day to God is like a thousand years to us. He lives in another dimension. He embodies every dimension. How many of you know what string theory is? Oh, I can see that we need a class in physics. Thank you very much. I would imagine that, that one of the... One of, one of you would raise your hand. That's good. It's an amazing fact that there are more than three or four dimensions. In fact, scientists are now estimating 10 to 13 different dimensions. This is something that most of us who eat at McDonald's don't really think about. Okay? I mean, we are so uh, much caught up in, in, in what goes on in our, in our everyday life that we don't spend time thinking about the fact that if we cannot see angels, yet we believe that they're standing right beside us and that they're here today uh, celebrating with us a great God of the universe whom they serve, and we can't see them, you can imagine that if you don't believe in other dimensions, that you would be sounding pretty crazy. So I'm telling you that I believe in other dimensions. I believe that there are beings that serve God who can pass through these dimensions at His command and on His errands. And who knows, the Bible says, that when you entertain the stranger, 
that you may actually be entertaining angels. They are at work, my friends. They are doing the bidding of the Heavenly Father. Question is, are we helping? They would love to know what it is to be human, but they don't get to be human. They're angels. We are human, and we look and think, what would it be like to be angels? Well, someday we're going to find out because we will be able to be in their presence, we will be able to be in God's presence, and we will be part of the entire universe. We will be able to travel and see it. I cannot wait. People who say, oh, going to heaven is boring. You're just going to sit on a cloud and play a harp. Whoever drew that picture should probably roast a little longer. <laughs> Because that is not the picture that God paints about the heavens. When you look with the, the, with the Hubble telescope, I, I don't know about you, but I want to go there. I want to see. I, I want to meet the, the, the intelligences that, that people like Ellen tell us about that are watching what is going on on planet Earth right now and are very interested in how the outcome will be. The question, are we alone? No, I don't believe we are. I believe that all the universe is watching. Will we be interested in coming home with the Father? And really, uh, how much time has passed in, 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 in terms of God and the dimension that he lives in? It's been short time. It's a short time, my friends. And those of you who have gone past the age of 60, let's just choose 60 because I'm not there yet. <laughs> those of you who have gone past the age of 60, you know how quickly you got to 60. The other day you were 30. And before that you were 15. But now you're 60 or 70 or 80. And you realize just how short a time it is. So my friends, before we get caught up this week, I'm going to ask you, spend some time thinking about the fact that God is our Father, that He has a name that He would like to give you. He has a, a mission He would like to send you on, on His behalf, and that He is the King of Heaven. He is the God Almighty. This is Jesus saying to his disciples, when you pray, when you think about God, when you address God, begin like this, our Father who is in heaven. You notice in your bulletin that we have a time now of, of uh, being at table. Normally speaking, we would offer you the opportunity to disperse to various parts of our property and to take the time to talk to somebody and to pray with somebody and to, to wash their feet. I'm taking a chance here. So, you know, uh, I, I removed all the rocks in, in the outside so that as I leave today, there won't be any stonings. <laughs> I'm going to pass out this piece of paper. I hope I made enough. If not, we'll make more. This piece of paper says, it's a promise note to God. So he got up from the table. This is Jesus now, and this is John 13, verses 4 and 5. He got up from the table, he took off his robe, and he wrapped a towel around his waist, and he poured water into a basin. He assumed the role of the servant. And the servant, not, not just the, the, the top servant or the top steward, he assumed the role of the person whose job it was to wash the stinky, dirty, dusty feet of anyone who came in the house. This was a custom in their day, and uh, it's still in many places, uh, like Canada and so on, where it's mucky and muddy and nasty. The habit is that you take your shoes off. If you're a Filipino and take your shoes off in the house, raise your hand. Okay, see, it's a custom in many other parts of the world. You take your outside shoes off and you put your inside shoes on. If you do that, you understand this custom that we have in the church of foot washing better 
better than, than most, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm not maybe the best at doing this because I'm lazy or I, I, feel, I feel like I don't want to, but my wife is now saying, we just got a few pieces of our carpet cleaned. Maybe we would like to start doing this. Taking our outside, outside shoes off and putting our inside shoes on, okay? But most of us do not really understand the moment of foot washing. So today we're going to have a bit of a lesson in that, in saying, here is the promissory note. Because Jesus came to serve me in my world, I promise that this week I will, dot, 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 and then there's a few lines for you to think in the next few minutes while I go ahead and ask you to hand these out. Okay. Think about what it is that you're going to do this week that, that would not be the usual. Okay. You're going to go into someone else's world, into someone else's life, and you're going to do something for them that you're not promising me. This is, again, this is not going to be between you and me or between you and the church. You're not going to get any special credit. Okay? This is going to be between you and God. All right? I promise that this week I will, then you put what you're going to do, for somebody in my world. And since I, this is uh, now John chapter 13, since I, the Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, this is Jesus now talking, you ought to wash each other's feet. So this, this is an opportunity for you to modernize this custom that we have in our church of washing feet. Rather than doing it uh, physically and not knowing why you're doing it, because the person's feet are perfectly clean because they took a shower this morning and they've got clean socks and clean shoes. You're going to choose something else. And I have come to understand that there are several places in this community that where there are people that need a lot of help. And, and if you want, I can tell you about them afterwards. I have given you an example to follow, Jesus says. Do as I have done to you. Okay? Some believe that the golden rule goes like this. Do unto others as you would want them to do to you, only do it first. I say that that's not the golden rule that I know about. This is, this is Jesus saying, I'm going to do, I'm going to show you what the golden rule is. I do. It's sitting on the deck there. If not, just take these two and copy them. Okay? I'm going to offer you that opportunity right now. If there's a, a no pen near you, just share. Or uh, we, will, we will continue and we'll have a little bit of contemplative music at this time. If you didn't get a, a, a paper, we'll make sure that you do uh, by the end of the service. I'm just going to invite uh, all those who are serving uh, with us today to just come on down when, when they can. This is, this is our way of celebrating the table that Jesus was at when he made it a, a memorial to himself. Sometime it will be fun as a church family to have what uh, is known as a, a Passover Seder. Um, there is a messianic version of that, which is very interesting, and particularly for the kids, uh, because Passover was for the whole family. It was uh, something not to be missed. It was a great big meal. But we have kind of reduced it down to this communion service. And we have a couple of elements here. We uh, also have, by the way, gluten-free bread today, so that if you need that, just please raise your hand. And we have somebody to serve that. But we have the opportunity for you to partake in these symbols. As a church, we practice 
uh, an open, what we call an open communion, which means that if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you are welcome to this table. It's not about denominational uh, affiliation, meaning if you are from another church, that does not matter to us as long as you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. And as we've already heard, he is the representative of the Godhead who came to show us the unselfish life. So let us just bow our heads and say thanks for the food. Father, we thank you for inviting us to this table through Jesus Christ and his suffering and his way forward. We are blessed today. We ask that as we partake, that we too will be a blessing to our world. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to kneel up here, if you would just remain seated, and uh, first Paul and then Eric are going to have grace for us. Let's pray. Lord, we're here with you. Uh, all of us together in the room here, Christ um, asked us to to come together and remember him. And the bread represents the body, the body of him and the body of us together. That we ask, Lord, that we do remember Christ and what he came for to be our Savior so that we might have everlasting peace and everlasting time with you. Amen. God, it is with wine that you chose to announce your earthly ministry at the wedding in Cana. And you counseled us to abide in you that we might bear much fruit as the power for life flowed through the vine. And you freely gave us your life blood as a token of the new covenant and are waiting even now to celebrate it with us anew in the kingdom. May we do this, as was said, in remembrance of you and with grateful hearts. Amen. As you will find out when we do the Passover communion, this was not just any piece of bread. It was in a stack of three, and it was the middle piece. But you'll have to come to the Passover communion to find out how that happened. Jesus took the dessert piece, and he said, This is my body that was broken for you. Take, eat. Four times in the Passover service, a cup is taken and drunk almost as a salute. This is the third cup. Jesus said, as Eric prayed, that he will not drink the fourth cup until he comes again and drinks it with all of us in the kingdom of heaven. But until then, we drink the cup of redemption in Jesus' name. 